Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Weaponizing the Global Economy, an event put together by LSA Ideas as part of its Global Economic Governance Commission. The purpose of the commission is to generate innovative solutions to our current poly crisis. In particular, we're focusing on how to adapt and evolve our global norms and institutions. I am Nicola Kluyamper. I'm an assistant professor at LSE's International Relations Department, and I'm commissioner with LSE Ideas. I work on issues at the intersection of business government relations and economic statecraft, and much of my research has really examined the transnational dynamics of the Russian oligarchy. I'm really delighted to be moderating this event today, even if we'll be discussing largely depressing topics, and I'm generally not sure what that says about me. Uh, but today we'll really be focusing on the implications of the geoeconomic responses to the Russian invasion, and our purposes here are twofold. First, we're going to be analyzing the spillover effects of the sanctions from various vantage points, from a geopolitical view, from a markets view, and then from an elite conflict view. More broadly, we'll be discussing how the most recent episode of Weaponizing the Global Economy is going to alter its structure and how we can mitigate and hopefully capitalize on a moment when the ordering principles of the global economy are shifting. Toward those ends, we have three truly fantastic speakers covering a range of backgrounds. First, we'll be hearing from Professor Abraham Newman, a professor at Georgetown University and the director of the Mortara Center for National Studies. Uh, Abe Newman is most probably most well known as one of the progenitors of the idea of weaponized interdependence from his international security article that numerous IR scholars have now labeled the most important idea of the last decade. Uh, he is also a phenomenal writer and highly prolific and is published in pretty much every major academic journal you can think of. Uh, next up, we'll have Rachel Ziemba, a geoeconomics and country risk expert. She currently runs Ziemba Insights, which provides macroeconomic and geopolitical analysis for a range of investors. In addition to Ziemba Insights, she's an adjunct fellow at the Center for New American Security and an advisor to Alpha Z Investments. She's also served as the head of emerging market research for uh, Ruvini Global Economics. She'll basically be focusing on how markets have responded and are expected to respond in the future to the current political conflict. And then finally, we'll hand the reins over to Ben Judah. He's a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, whose policy work covers transnational kleptocracy, Britain's role in the world, as well as, Bi as, well as Biden's foreign policy. He is an esteemed journalist. He's worked with a range of think tanks on how to counter, uh, how to counter money laundering. And he's probably most well known, I would say at least most well known to me, as the author of the phenomenal nonfiction book, This is London, that I recommend you all go out and buy today. Uh, each of our panelists will be speaking for roughly 10 minutes before we open up a discussion to a broader Q&A. But before we get going, I just wanted to kind of set the stage for us a bit. And by, by kind of talking about three major, uh, what I would label extraordinary aspects of the crisis today. And I want to use them to kind of pose some larger questions around how we can think about both weaponizing the global economy and the broader structure of our national institutions today. So first, I would say that what the crisis has really shown and what the, what the US and quote unquote Western response has illustrated is that Russia's attempts to guard itself from US economic power have largely failed. So basically since the 2000s, basically throughout the Putin regime and most clearly since the Great, uh, the Great Recession, Russia has tried to actively insulate itself uh, from any type of economic pressure from the US or the European Union while still maintaining strong financial ties and interlinkages to the global economy. And so they've been able to do this through a few, or try to do this through a few different mechanisms. They've tried to diminish their import dependence. They've onshored a whole bunch of production. A lot of the offshore wealth has come back home. And most, most notably and most famously, they've built up a huge, huge set of currency reserves. And, they all, and they've always operated with a large amount of fiscal space. But those currency reserves, as within the first week of the, of the invasion, were basically taken away from them. Well, half of them were because they were sanctioned collectively by a whole bunch of, by the G7 fundamentally. Uh, so while the short-run currency crisis fears that started off in the first couple weeks of the invasion and the banking crisis fears have kind of all have largely subsided, it's still really quite apparent that Russia's economy is going through a truly brutal phase, right? We're talking about 10 to 15 percent growth declines. We're talking about double-digit inflations. This is the worst economic performance Russia is going to have since definitely since 2008, almost certainly since 1998. And Arguably the most dramatic aspect of this though is that, is that Russia is not going to have access to a whole bunch of technology required to actually like upgrade and maintain their manufacturing capacity. And this is true of both, as well as uh, almost certainly their military capacity. And so exports from Russia to, uh, to Russia from places like Taiwan, from South Korea, and even from China have really dramatically dropped in the last couple of months. We've actually seen Korean exports to Russia drop roughly 62% in the last two months alone. We've also seen even Germany's exports to Russia are basically at back to the levels they were at in 2004. So this is really clearly taking a place on the, on the manufacturing side, even though much of our discussion is often on the financial side. And so together, right, these facts are, suggest a few big questions to me, right? First is, 
what, what, what does this episode suggest we're going to see other states that might want to protect themselves from U.S. coercion try to actually start doing in the future? Uh, most clearly, most specifically, right, can we actually have this type of response against some a country like China, which is far more integrated into our global economy, if we were to enter, enter some kind of much more explicit conflict with China? When I say we, I mean the U.S. or the European Union here. And can we afford to have that kind of weaponization when we clearly require substantial U.S.-Chinese cooperation to tackle climate change? And so that's on the state response side, right? But the private sector response has arguably been even more damaging to Russia than the public sectors. And that, in my opinion, is like quite a major double-edged sword. Right? So we've seen dozens of, both uh, hundreds at this point, European and American companies pull out of the Russian market. And these types of moves are happening for a couple of different reasons, right? So first is kind of the ambiguity of the sanctions here, right? We are really still not sure where they're going to go. That's led to a whole bunch of companies kind of reassess the value of the Russian economy. If they're going to go back to the 1970s style Soviet economy in terms of their growth rates, right? American, well, multinational corporations just don't have that many incentives to be there. There's also a major secondary reputational effect here, right? No one wants to, at least in the short term, be seen engaging with a warm or warmongering regime. This is really tricky, though, because one of the keys to making sanctions work is to make is to make sure that their removal is credible, right? So that the gains from the from the aggressor are actually going to come back to them if they stop behaving that way. And so, when the private sector de-risks so dramatically, can adversaries actually be incentivized to come to the bargaining table? Do we need some kind of forward guidance now, forward guidance regime, in the way we have for central banks, right, to kind of set the to better manage the expectations of the private sector going forward as we see more types of course of activity by the likes of the U.S. And finally, that takes me to the private, the private actors in Russia, right? That's the plutocratic class or the oligarch class of Russia that has come under very serious sanctions. Uh, and honestly, the thing that's surprising to me is that we think that's going to work, right? That's, that's going to, so our model of politics here seems to assume that by making life really difficult for the Russian billionaires, they're gonna, it's going to force them to kind of put pressure on the Putin regime. But I think that kind of belies how the regime actually operates today, right? So the true oligarchs, the true ones with the political power today, have all basically onshored most of their wealth over the past 10 years. They're heavily relying on state revenues to actually make their money. And so they're highly, they're actually much more internally focused than I think we I give, give them credit for. The ones who are still integrated into the global economy, who sell lots of offshore wealth, are often the ones who, don't, who lack the political power. Right? Those offshore activities are a way to protect themselves. And so the, the ones we can most easily sanction are actually the ones least likely to actually be able to influence change. And so when we step back, right, thinking about one of the things that I'm really trying to think about, and I'm hoping Ben speaks to this, right, is how is the crisis going to alter how elites from other countries structure their wealth? And is that going to actually minimize the effectiveness of targeted sanctions going forward? And how will that reorganization matter when other tax havens appear more than willing to step up the plate to fill any voids that the US and the UK create? So I have my own opinions on many of these questions, as you can imagine. But on that note, I'm going to hand over the mic to Abe. Great. Uh, thanks, Nick. Um, maybe what you know, I wanted to zoom out a little bit and just kind of think about what does this incident, the you know, the the Western response to Russian aggression, uh, what does it mean about the way we should think about the world uh, and the role that, um, you know, economic networks play in uh, global affairs? And so I just, I want to make three points um, following Nick's three points. Um, so we can have six points in total. Uh, but the, the, you know, the first is, is that I think um, that this is uh, a, a wake up call for um, all the, I, I would say like the standard story of how we thought about the relationship between globalization um, and international politics. And it was a story that uh, started, you know, at the end of the Cold War. Um, and it was a story that really talked about the triumph of economic networks over uh, state interests. Um, and so when you think about uh, Thomas Friedman, uh, The World is Flat, or um, the end of history, there was a whole string of arguments that were made that really uh, states were neutered by the um, dominance of economic uh, interests. And here you can think about, you know, the, the footloose capital driving, uh, you know, any state into uh, penury if they, you know, resisted or uh, went against what the state or what, what the private interests wanted. But also it became illogical for states to go to war with each other because of their interests, uh, the, the way that their economic interests were all intertwined. And that I think that, you know, it, it's not the first time that this uh, has been shown to be a fallacy, but I think the uh, attack on Ukraine and the Western response demonstrates that 
Um, this, this is not the relationship between globalization and international politics that should be uh, the primary frame. Um, I, and I, I think that we can go even further. What it demonstrates is not only that war and globalization are irreconcilable, irreconcilable, oh, I can't say that, irreconcilable, uh, but even more that um, these economic networks are actually part of war. So it's, you know, there was an argument, a secondary argument that economic coercion was an alternative to war and that it was something that was kept out of or kept us out of conflict. Uh, but what we're seeing right now is the ways in which uh, economic coercion has really uh, become part of um, the battlefield. So I think it's like a, a reminder that there was this uh, naive version of what uh, globalization meant for international politics. Uh, we have to move beyond that. Uh, we have to think about the way not only that um, economic coercion can be uh, an alternative, but also part of conflict itself. Okay, the second uh, then point that I want to make is kind of how that how that plays out. And this is drawing on my work with Henry Farrell um, on weaponized interdependence, where uh, what we're arguing is, is that the, the types of coercion are also, uh, you know, transforming, that the traditional uh, you know, way states engage with each other was by limiting market access, was to say, you know, if you do something we don't like, then you can't sell to our people. Um, and that was going to be the way that we were going to punish um, our adversaries. And what we're increasingly seeing is that uh, people are not just conditioning market access, but they're conditioning network access, that there are global economic networks um, that all rely on. Some of them are national, you know, nationally based in the United States or in a specific country, but it's that's not really the way that uh, the U.S. is then pushing you know, its agenda on a country like Russia or China. It's by conditioning access to these critical um, nodes or hubs in these economic networks. And so the basic insight of our argument is just to say, you know, global networks are not symmetric. They're not decentralized. Um, uh, so, you know, some are, but th these critical ones are not. Um, and that they center around these asymmetric distributions of interaction where a few key hubs then have disproportionate economic power. These are private actors and they have this disproportionate economic power and that states are conditioning access to them. And so, you know, uh, like Nick was mentioning, you know, the foreign reserves and the, uh, the Russian kind of, you know, war chest that was built up. Their problem is, is that they, a lot of that stuff, they have to sell to someone on a secondary market to buy that stuff. And that's where the sanctions bite is because they really, um, they condition access to those international banks, the kind of the key nodes of the financial system. Similar, similarly, when you think about the aviation system within Russia and its uh, soon inability to fly, it's, it's not because, you know, uh, they, they need to fly to the United States. They don't care that they don't have access to the United States. It's that they can't get access to the Boeing supply chain and that Boeing has become such an inordinately powerful company in global aviation networks, and that's what's the problem. Similarly, um, I was re recently in a, in a session where um, there was the, the, the problem that uh, Russia's version of Facebook faces, that it's trying to take over, you know, YouTube. It's trying to like provide an alternative, a domestic alternative, but they can't get the servers that they need, enough of them, because they rely on products that uh, contain U.S. chips. And so it's just, you know, it's another example where, you know, whether it's uh, intangibles like financial services, whether it's very physical things like uh, aviation parts, or where sometimes it's intellectual property, like the information that's in the chips that they need for their servers, they're all produced by just a handful of companies that the U.S. or the European governments can target and say, if you, you know, if you keep behaving the way you're you're behaving, we're not going to get you give you access to these things. Well, that turns the whole logic of you know the world is flat on its head. The world is actually not flat. It's often very centralized, uh, and that actually that centralization provides for uh, points of control, which the United States in particular has been leveraging increasingly over the last few years. So uh, the final point that I want to make is, um, you know, maybe the policy point, which is to say these tools 
are very dangerous in the sense that they can have very large consequences. You can ground a country's uh, domestic airline industry. Like that's a pretty radical type of action uh, to be taken. And so uh, I'm, my concern is that policymakers don't really have uh, you know, fully worked out what's three steps down the line. Where does this take us? Um, and I, I often like to use the analogy to when nuclear weapons were first uh, on the scene after World War II or, you know, at the end of World War II, uh, where, you know, policymakers and academics, they didn't have the idea of mutually assured destruction. It didn't come with a set of rules like printed on the nuclear devices. They had to come up with those ideas and they had to come up with, you know, what is a proportional response? What is the idea of, you know, transparency around, um, you know, alerting people about what, how the these will be used and won't be used. Uh, what are the ground rules around a world where we weaponize global economic networks? And I think that this is really, this is the key uh, point when we think about how other countries will respond. You know, do they develop their own economic networks? Do they try to subvert U.S. economic networks? It all depends on if there's a, a realistic expectation that these tools will be used with some kind of um, proportionality and also under legitimate uh, concerns. And as they be, uh, as they're used in ways that are unpredictable and seen by others as illegitimate, uh, at least in my mind, you're more likely going to see um, not just responses to the networks, but also you know kinetic responses. Like people will blow up ships because they'll be you know feeling that there there's no there's no real uh, value left in these networks. And so, you know, I, I think it's it's a huge conversation to have, and um, I'm happy to keep, you know, having or talking about that in this session, but I really think developing um, a strategic understanding uh, and coming up with a what I would think of as a doctrine of weaponized interdependence is uh, an essential next step in order to prevent uh, the worst outcomes from happening, but also, you know, using these tools for good. Um, as you were suggesting, Nick, is, you know, you, you could use these things not just uh, to, uh, you know, uh, punish people for things you don't like, but you could also incentivize private actors to cooperate around climate change um, or corruption, or there's a lot of different places where uh, unilateral uh, uh, coercion can be used to promote um, uh, positive change in the world. And in my view, you know, how we're using these tools right now in Ukraine is an example of using these tools for good um, and to uh, limit Russian uh, um, encroachments into Ukrainian sovereignty. So I think that they're they're very um, powerful tools, and we need to uh, wrap them up uh, in a set of predictable and understandable um, uh, uh, best practice, so that we don't we don't go into a, a you know the darker world. Maybe you started with at the beginning of the session. Great, thank you, Abe. Uh, next up, we have Rachel Ziemba. Thanks very much, Nikhil. Um, pleasure to be here with you all, and, and thanks for the invitation. Always great to talk with the three of you. Um, Nikhil asked me to focus on how financial markets have responded, and 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 in particular, I think this is sort of over compliance and and greater role of the private sector. Um, I, I want to start by sort of high, you know, sort of highlighting. A uh, couple of ways in which the, so the Russia sanctions episode is unique, um, and to highlight some things that we might have been worried about going into it that maybe um, have been surprisingly easier in terms of uh, keeping the coalition together. Um, that has been largely because of the severity and situation on the ground, um, rather, and as well as any sort of diplomacy, but also to highlight some risks that I see about not only kind of future use of these coercive tools, but also some of the other global challenges that we're trying to address at the same time and which may be exacerbated um, by these issues. And I'm, I'm, I'm alluding, of course, to energy and food price dynamics, but also uh, dynamics of unsustainable debt burdens and just sustainable economic growth. Issues that I'm sure the commission will be talking about in other reports, so we're not going to deal with it all in our, um, in our hour today. But I think it's quite important to explain the nature of countries that are sort of formally, you know, sort of part of this sanctioning coalition, the countries that are on the sidelines but are not transgressing the sanctions yet, um, and, and the like, uh, 
Um, you know, overall, of course, from a global financial market perspective, the biggest impacts have been through commodity channels. I mean, we are talking about um, uh, significant flows of, of food and other commodities that have been disrupted by conflict, as well as uh, sort of other commodities disrupted um, via sort of sanction, self-sanctioning and, and Russian policy choices. Um, overall, I mean, I think when we you know, uh, one of the taglines for this sort of event was sort of, you know, are sanctions working? I agree very much with Abe that we need to be thinking about this case and many sanctions cases is that sanctions shouldn't be thought of as acting alone or being effective alone. They're particularly challenging when you're dealing with a country that's as large as Russia is, not necessarily size of its economy, but size of the commodities and entities into, into the global economy. Um, and, and the like. And this is happening at a time when global energy markets, other commodity markets were already stretched somewhat thin uh, due to a mismatch between producers and demanders, uh, particularly on the energy side, but also relating to uh, other key commodities. And so that's where I also think we have to think about impacts and lessons learned of where we are in this sort of not post pandemic world, um, but this sort of new normal we're, we're navigating towards um, and, and the like and that, that policy dynamic. Um, so that's number one is sort of size of, you know, sort of scale of the economy. Um, and that also made Russia difficult, to, it made it difficult to target one of the largest sources of Russian government revenue. So uh, the choices of the sanctions that we chose, that the coalition chose to put into place were really high, were targeting the financial transactions, they were targeting and mobilizing the central bank, they were targeting the oligarchs. Ben, I know we'll talk in a lot of detail about that piece. Um, but this, and, and then made it very difficult for Russia to import items. Uh, but a lot of revenues continue, sort of continued and were propped up by the fact that global commodity prices rose. And so that's a function of both the choices we made, but also the fact that where we are with Russia um, in the sanctions episode means that there aren't sort of cheap, easy, asymmetric policies as there might have been if this was a smaller country. Now we can get in the Q and A the questions of effectiveness even for smaller countries, but but that's a different story. You know, number two, obviously, uh, this breadth of countries that participated that came together very quickly. Um, U.S. government officials might highlight that it took them sort of many months and, and years of sort of coordination. Um, but I think the situation on the ground really meant that there was fast waves of sanctions in ways that sanctions professionals would say are, 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 are atypical. Um, this has been quite extensive transatlantic and developed economy co uh, coordination. I'm throwing countries like Taiwan and, and South Korea into sort of developed market sort of context. We can have that analytical debate later. Um, but I do think that sort of the breadth of that coalition is, is, is really unique. And I think it meant in some ways that some of the things people might have worried about around the role of the US dollar, for example, had maybe been diminished, um, not removed completely. There still are questions about alternate payment systems down the line, and there's still questions about the integrity of the system. But the fact that every major G10 currency um, faced many of the same restrictions, not identical, um, I think meant that this whole element of it wasn't safe enough to move funds into Switzerland or to move funds to Japan or elsewhere, um, I think sort of puts a different perspective on a sort of US dollar assets. Now, that being said, even if there was more transatlantic and developed economy cohesion, uh, much less so with emerging market economies, and that reflects, of course, you know, different views about energy and food supply, but also other lingering issues. Um, you know, we can maybe come back to the, the, the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council countries in particular. Um, number three is that there is a lot of new tools that are being used now, um, particularly export controls that Nikhil you sort of highlighted and that piece of denying Russian entities more broadly, but especially military ones, access to inputs, technological and otherwise needed for their industrial base, needed for resupplying. I mean, this is well, this is deploying these tools on a much larger scale. Up to this point, some of these tools 
um, you know, really had only been used on indiv on individual companies or on militaries. And that I think is important because it also gets us to what's the goal here that um, intermediate and long term that we're trying to um, uh, achieve. Um, longer term, of course, it raises some issues around uh, how other countries will adjust um, and, and whether they can. I'm watching China very closely and to what extent China can double down on de-Americanizing key supply chains. And that's important because, of course, that was arguably a priority of the domestic side of their dual circulation system anyways. So not a short term issue, um, but a longer term one when we think about the rules of the global economy. Um, obviously, the role of the private sector going far above and beyond, especially in announcements, uh, has been really unique. Um, now, escalation and overcompliance happen often when sanctions are, um, are, are, are escalating. They're a design feature for many uh, policymakers. Um, in this case, of course, the speed, severity, the role of social media, the role of broadcast media, good uh, sort of messaging from Ukrainians, I think, added to these dynamics. But I share the concern that Nikhil sort of highlighted that these policies then are not that easy to reverse. Even if there are plenty of countries, there are certain companies that have said they're leaving that maybe are still figuring out what that looks like. But ultimately, I think for a lot of US, European, even some Asian partners, uh, these counterparts in Russia are not trustworthy, to, even to the extent that they were before. And so I think that that creates, that, that sort of creates a, a lot of opportunities for, for illicit flows. Um, you know, I overall, I think, you know, sort of want to sort of conclude with kind of, you know, ask the sort of, you know, sort of where is Russia um, and, and what's where is Russia likely to be evolving? We are looking at the economic prospect of Russia that's much more insular, lacking access to global financial markets, um, choosing to not forego growth and investment. That makes it, I think, very hard to, that can makes it much harder to apply our usual cost benefit um, analyses. State dominant players probably become more, more powerful rather than less. Um, it won't make it easy for foreigners to exit large joint ventures. That raises issues for um, the existing debt. I think we lost Rachel for a second. I assume she's going to rejoin us, but in the interim, uh, Ben, do you want to pick up? Because I think Rachel was wrapping up as it was. Yes, I'd be very happy to. And firstly, I just wanted to say thank you for inviting me to speak today on such an esteemed uh, panel. It's always uh, a pleasure to do anything with the uh, LSE. So I'd like to begin uh, really uh, talking about what I view as having been an attempt by the uh, Western uh, governments and their allies to weaponize a leverage that wasn't uh, fully there and to talk about what that tells us about Russia and about this uh, question of weaponized interdependence uh, today. And the question that I'd like to talk about is really that of oligarch sanctions and the kind of transnational oligarchic kleptocratic uh, network that was perceived as such as an important almost foundational part of Russian power and Russian capitalism and was highly visible in London, in the South of France, in uh, New York and in other European kind of financial capitals and uh, tourist uh, destinations. But before we get onto that, you know, we can often feel like we live in a world today where we're truly swamped with information. There's an illusion of vast amounts of information coming through uh, Twitter. So many feeds to follow, so many uh, dispatches uh, to read, so many interviews uh, to watch. But the reality is, is that the Putin um, regime has actually been a misdiagnosed object in international uh, relations over the last uh, 10 years, I would say. And it's really caught up with that word regime. Um, the idea of a regime is a political structure where it might be centered around one man or one dominant authoritarian figure, but there are other poles, there are other 
pushes and pulls on that individual's uh, choice of action. These could be powerful security barons, or they could be oligarchs, or they could be party chiefs, or they could be constraints from uh, public opinion. It's not a uh, political system where decisions are taken alone. And that was the framework in which uh, European and American governments uh, were looking at uh, Russia over the last 10 years. Just think back to those endless references to the uh, Putin regime. And the reason that it was talked about as such is really this has been going on for really a very long time now, the uh, rule of Vladimir uh, Putin. This is somebody who first assumes uh, power um, in 1999, formally fully in the uh, year uh, 2000. And this political structure has evolved from being something at first maybe comparable to the regime that Tayyip Erdogan has in uh, Turkey, a kind of strong man in a failing democracy with relationships with uh, elections or relationships with political uh, factions and relationships with powerful oligarchs that simply can't be brushed aside, need to be negotiated with, to the situation that we have to have today, where we can say that uh, this regime has evolved into a personalist dictatorship, where Putin truly took the decisions uh, leading to the Ukraine uh, war uh, alone. So just going to give you an example of that transition the two kind of striking images for me is to compare that decision to go to war in 20, 2014 against ukraine the first russian military intervention in uh ukraine and that's the decision that has started the dirty war in the donbass and the creation of the puppet republics and of course the annex crimea and that putin has told us how he took this decision he says that he took this decision by gathering those he called his colleagues into the Kremlin. They discussed all night. They looked at the pros and cons of uh, this uh, decision. They looked at opinion polling. How popular would an annexation of Crimea be with the uh, Russian people? They considered the risks of uh, sanctions. And at the end of this meeting, they um, decided to proceed with the uh, annexation of Crimea and the military intervention. So that was a uh, Russia, which many Western diplomats and Western leaders believed was anchored around Putin. But there was a sort of politburo there where these transnational kleptocratic oligarchs with one foot in London, one foot in Moscow, uh, one foot in sort of Tel Aviv, one foot in uh, Kiev, one, you know, a third foot in uh, Moscow were believed to be uh, influencers on politics would believe to have people who have the power to say i'm not sure that's a good idea or maybe potentially to pull putin back from certain actions so now compare this to um really this historic um video of how uh where putin began the process of um uh, of war in ukraine and he gathered you know this is a lot of the same people who were present at that conversation in 2014 to a meeting of what's called the uh, security council in the kremlin and asked uh, for their advice on the decision whether or not to recognize the independence of um the donetsk and luhansk so-called people's republics and it was so obvious from the way that these people were moving, frightened, nervous, shifty, unable even to look at him. And this uh, now iconic shot of Putin asking the advice of the head of foreign in uh, intelligence, his uh, views are on the matter. And the individual was so frightened uh, when Putin started to uh, contradict him over a certain choice of uh, phrase that he forgot what topic was he was being asked about and said he was ready to recognize these territories uh, uh, inclusion into uh, into uh, uh, Russia. So that was a clear example of the decisions having been taken alone of Putin gathering them there not to consult them but gathering there in you know what there's a there is a sort of a, a Russian term for this of Krugovaya Paruka or a sort of mafia concept of dipping the hands in the blood of making sure all of these political figures were seen in the eyes of the world and the eyes of the Russian public as responsible with it. So that's a completely different format of decision making from the one that was believed to be there. And this is where uh, we come to the issue of how 
Western policymakers, I think, misjudged and misdiagnosed uh, the role that oligarch sanctions and elite sanctions were going to play. So firstly, if you've misdiagnosed what the Putin system is, if you think it's a Putin regime and you haven't realized that it's a personalist dictatorship centered around Vladimir Putin, you've fundamentally misdiagnosed the role of these so-called oligarchs uh, within it. You've, you're operating under the assumption that they are powerful men, and they are all men, uh, who act of their own volition, who have their own views that can say no, and that can potentially kind of organize and pull back. And because these individuals have a footprint in the West, you're assuming that you have leverage over them that can be used as a deterrent. All the way through in these negotiations on the eve of war, it was threatened that severe oligarch sanctions would come down on the Russian elite if Putin chose to uh, go to war. And it acted it didn't act as a deterrent. It didn't actually factor meaningfully in his um, decision making. He was not sort of turned away uh, by that. And no, full, full well knowing this was a possibility, these individuals were not capable of mobilizing to uh, stop it, to defend their own uh, financial uh, interests. And so this comes back to a misdiagnosis of really what oligarchs are. That's our second misdiagnosis here. You know, we have, because this regime has gone on for so long, we had this image that they are the kind of these figures bestriding Russian politics like they were in the uh, 1990s, like Boris uh, Berezovsky. But in fact, the roles have largely been uh, inverted. And if you look at a gathering that was reported in the Western press as an oligarchs gathering in the Kremlin of Russia's leading businessmen, for the most part, these were not what we'd understand as oligarchs at all. These were state um, business, these were state enterprise chiefs with a uh, intelligence um, past selected by Putin. So these were not oligarchs that Putin worked for or oligarchs that had chosen Putin, which was the assumption of how things would run you know, first by Berezovsky before he was destroyed by Vladimir Putin. But on the other side of that long destruction of the oligarchs and their liquidation as a class, we see what we think of as oligarchs as being people who, to sort of quote the old Moscow joke, really sort of work as oligarchs. Very few of them in that room were sort of their own uh, men, uh, so to speak. And the ones that were, were dramatically uh, weakened. So given that the Russian political system had changed, just to kind of echo what uh, the panelists have been uh, saying, and that actually, despite you know, these images on these sort of well-known stories of the Russian elite's sort of international presence from the family of Sergei Lavrov in South Kensington to children at sort of public schools or sort of Swiss uh, finishing uh, schools. In fact, it was a lot more, uh, it was a lot more domestically uh, focused, domestically constrained and under the influences of other elements of the Russian elite that we had less acquaintanceship with from uh, the sort of Gazprom uh, investor day and who didn't read the uh, FT and who didn't uh, enjoy turning up in sort of mansions in London, i.e. The, se the security services, the sort of famous uh, Sylvie Keys. I think that led to an attempt to, we simply overestimated our leverage that we had over Vladimir Putin. Uh, we overestimated the weight that this inter interdependence would uh, give us. We failed to achieve deterrence on the, through this particular uh, threat. And um, that came from really a misdiagnosis. So, so just going to move on to the second part of this, which is to go, just because um, it didn't work in deterring Putin doesn't mean what's happened hasn't been effective in really hurting this transnational kleptocratic oligarch uh, class. These are individuals who lost over 40 billion uh, in wealth in a single day. And there has been um, some voices of condemnation from some of them. There have been some voices of lament from some of them. One or two of them have sort of stepped out and been uh, punished. And one of them has uh, tried to save his own skin and save his own uh, wealth by, you know, playing a role in pursuing, um, to, to, in pursuing uh, talks. I'm slightly unconcerned about the status of UK libel laws at the moment, so I might just avoid um, being giving too many details uh, away about some of the people I'm thinking of. But the reality here is, is that all of these voices that we can record and we can see have actually been kind of voices of, of weakness, and they're 
the voices that were finally raised showed them to be really remnants of a previous uh, uh, political era and not actually kind of dominant or able to shape um, Kremlin uh, policy. You know, what this reflects is that the Kremlin and the state's leverage over these people was simply so much more uh, vast than any of the kind of Western uh, leverage uh, of them uh, was. So now just sort of looking ahead, I'll sort of tell you some things that are sort of on my, my mind uh, at the moment. The first is this kind of problem of like misdiagnosing Russia and misunderstanding where uh, power lies. It's really kind of clear to me that we didn't spend enough time collectively in the analytical community, both within government and outside, in trying to really understand the Siloviki, to try and really understand who there were, what ideologies were percolating and circulating uh, amongst them, how do they live, how does that shape their uh, worldview. I think there was an overemphasis on the bit of the Russian elite that was right in front of our eyes in Westminster to the detriment of that part of the Russian uh, uh, elite that sort of gathers in specific FSB uh, or SVR only hunting lodges outside of uh, of Moscow or sort of deep in the countryside and, and never ventures uh, uh, abroad and has little contact uh, abroad. So I think that we need to really kind of launch a new intellectual effort to better understand these uh, uh, these uh, people and not take that sort of illusion of proximity to Russia at uh, uh, face value just because there are children at uh, uh, sort of Eton or Radley with parents in the Russian elite doesn't mean that we really understand the Russian elite. Um, next question that's coming to me is what's going to happen to that transnational kleptocratic uh, oligarchic um, sort of strand of global uh, capitalism. Well, it's not going to disappear from international uh, finance. It's probably going to become more kleptocratic because so many simply trading with these people has become uh, uh, illegal. They have more incentives now to try and take some, you know, greater sums of their money outside Russia and to hide them offshore. But it's not going to be going through London or through Western jurisdictions in the same way. And already we can see a sort of reconstitution of that in Dubai. Uh, taking shape and that's uh, there are a lot of very interesting kind of quite profound geopolitical questions that come out of that to do with are we going to impose how far are we going to go in the imposition of secondary uh, sanctions in the pursuit of these people how far are we going to staff up in uh, a sanctions regime to stop these uh, uh, people really simply implementing the Iran sanctions stretch the treasury uh, here in the United States to um, its limits. Are we really going to be capable of hiring that many people? And then how are we going to sustain? How are we going to sustain it? And the last question that's really on my my mind, I think, it's probably going to be on the minds of lots of people uh, watching this, is the question of May 9th and the question of will Putin formally declare uh, war? Like one of the kind of key things about this conflict is that it was planned as a special uh, operation. It was believed by Putin to be a special operation and Putin's forces believed that that was going to take place and they were essentially going to uh, march within a few days to a victory parade into uh, Kiev and that that was based on catastrophically uh, poor uh, intelligence and uh, poor planning. But since then there's been obviously and very visibly a transition both on the ground to a war, perhaps a long-term war of attrition, that's certainly what it looks like, and a shift in the propaganda in Russia towards uh, a, a war. And the question that many people are asking themselves is will Putin formally declare war on May 9th, which is the sort of victory day, the sort of hallowed historic uh, day of memory for victory against uh, uh, Nazism in World War II, which will give him some very specific uh, powers such as mobilizing uh, reserves to send into combat, which won't transform the conflict overnight. Like these people would need to be trained. A lot of them would not be really sort of useful uh, in uh, many ways. But would this mean, and this is the sort of point to bring us back to this question of uh, oligarchy and kleptocracy, this could also give Putin uh, a new opportunity to really move towards a war economy if he formally uh, declares war and um, move towards a regime of sort of rationing certain uh, objects, certain uh, uh, certain, acti certain uh, activities and switch the economy into a mode that he might believe will help it to uh, withstand the um, you know brutal effects of uh, sanctions uh, which the other panelists were 
uh, talking about. And if he does do that, and this is going to be my kind of final comment, I think that that would, that would further take us away from a Russia of oligarchs into a Russia where really there is only the state politically. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Ben. I fully agree with the need to kind of update our mental models here. Uh, so uh, I, before we get into q and I just want to hand it back to Rachel, but I do want to mention to our audience, if you do have any questions, please use the Q&A function. We'll get to you shortly. Uh, so Rachel. Thanks very much and apologize for losing you guys <laughs> mid-sentence. Um, I, I just wanted to conclude and, and, and highlight with a sort of a, a few things to kind of watch on sort of a, a, a global institution perspective. Nikhil asked me to sort of think about some of those. Um, across the board, I think we've highlighted a lot of these powerful tools which are, are being used. We've talked about the limitations of power. And I think my response to Ben's question on, on oligarchs is also not only do we somewhat target what we can see, we target some of the things that we might think we can live with the costs of. And often sanctions sometimes can be used when, you know, when we're not sort of at a war, but at a time when there is uh, a need to do something. And so I'm, you know, I, and I'm not saying that targeting oligarchs doesn't bring costs, but it, and in some ways it might have been a way to avoid certain of the other costs, which we may be coming around now too on, for example, significantly reducing reliance on Russian energy. So, but across the board, um, I would say there's a need for not just cohesion on restrictive policies and defensive measures, militarily and economically, but also what are the constructive proactive measures to mitigate against these these risks which of course are tougher because they usually involve spending money rather than restricting access to our markets and this is something it's a debate that we've had sort of around not just these issues but around sort of u.s china relations tariffs and sanction restrictions versus spending more at home or spending with allies right so it's maybe a topic for another time as well um, but overall, I think really thinking about the global risks that come from uh, some of these, these tools that we're deploying. Um, also, we are now grappling with the fact that um, institutions like the G20 that already had questions being effective are now effectively um, immobilized for certain ways, not just because Russia is in, in, in place, but also because of where China and some other entities are, are involved. Um, you know, sort of thinking about what the what the, the architecture looks like, and and I'm not saying we just create new institutions because the other ones, um, but thinking about what are the things we really need to get done, and who are the countries there. Overall, irrespective of the war and weaponizing sanctions in the context, I think 2022 was going to be a year where we had the real question of could the would the Biden administration move from bilateral measures and coordination with Asian countries, say on supply chain measures, into something that was a little more regional, a little more, you know, minilateral. What was that going to look like? There's a really important sort of set of Asian trips, for example, uh, coming up uh, this month, I guess, we're in May, um, where sort of question marks about will there be some process on integrating export control regimes? Um, I'm not optimistic on anything on the formal trade side. Um, it's not really going to happen. But I think this sort of question mark about how do we get things done? How do we not only deal with the immediate crisis of how do we keep people fed and, uh, you know, heating and heated and cooled, depending on the time of year, um, but uh, how do we kind of get to sort of some of the energy transition goals that, if anything, this issue has, this, this conflict has showed us that we weren't realistic about how to get there, but that we also need to get there. Um, all topics I'm sure the commission will be talking about. And so that includes things like specific measures, like maybe new uh, sort of addressing uh, sort of export controls, but also new ways of sort of moving forward with the sort of, IA, you know, sort of IEA um, and, and the like. I've taken way more than my summary time. So I look forward to the questions and uh, for the thoughts from those in the audience and, and all of the good creative thinking we're going to be doing over the next days, weeks, and months.
Great. Thank you, Rachel. I want to start with a quite specific question from the audiences, right? So again, traditionally, we think about sanctions as deterrent effects or kind of you know, avoid certain types of behavior, but the Biden administration has quite actively framed these set of sanctions as punitive. And so is that kind of a self-admission or a self, like a, a recognition that maybe these sanctions are not the effective tool right now? Uh, if so, where should we, where should we be expecting the, uh, the Biden administration to be going forward? Uh, feel free to chime in with any of your thoughts. Well, I think there's actually, if, if I may, I'm sure others will have things to add. Um, I think that there, there are member, measures, the members of the Biden administration that have framed this as punitive. There are measures who are also really focusing on degrading Russia's industrial and military base to make sure this doesn't happen again. Also to try to bring the conflict to, to an end. I think one of the challenges as we look and think it's a little overly <laughs> mechanical, um, but to think about effectiveness is, how do you measure effectiveness if your goals weren't clear? Um, and so it's, you know, it's, and, that, and that's, you know, analytically and academically, we, we think about that. Um, one of the things that worried me a little bit about the current negotiation with Venezuela is it felt like the goals of what we were going to say about whether they worked was not, was not clear. Now, now, clearly it was a, maybe they can bring more oil onto the market. Um, and uh, again, topic from their time. But, but I think the broader issue here is that sanctions are being, sanctions and these other measures we're talking about are being used as a, a sort of a whole set of broader sort of policy tools. Uh, ben talked about uh, the measures that are being done on the, on the military side, what additional things one can do. Um, and I think we also have to be realistic that some of our sanctions measures are really focused on medium term degrading of uh, capital stock and, and the like, that can lead to a Russia that in some ways is dangerous in, in different ways for the global economy. It can lead to uh, a, a series of risks, but choosing to, for example, cut off uh, ex, you know, sort of key imports, uh, those don't necessarily kick in right away. Though with a country that is expending a lot of technology in a conflict, they may actually be kicking in more quickly um, than, than we would normally think. So, you know, yes, this has definitely been a reminder that sanctions alone, when it's really important to the target entities, don't necessarily lead to that policy change, but they're one of a set of tools. Great. Aber Ben, do you want to chime in on that one or move on? Well, um, I think everything Rachel said, I would just agree with that. <clears throat> you have to put sanctions in context. And so you know, we are doing, uh, providing military aid. There are lots of other different aid programs that are happening. So it's not just a sanctions program. Um, I also just wanna emphasize that foreign policy is always messy and you rarely um, evaluate foreign policy. How long has the United States attempted to get peace in the Middle East as the foreign policy objective? We very rarely then say the US foreign policy is an abject failure across the board because it has not succeeded in that. It's just, it's, you know, life is messy. But the third thing that I want to emphasize is that um, what sometimes is cast as virtue signaling, I think in a derogatory way, is a really important moral statement of condemning this action and saying this is not acceptable in the world community. And I think it's the failure of us to do that uh, in the Crimea case that then led up to this very um, escalation. And so we, we have to be able to send a strong signal. And I think it's clear from internal, you know, what, what we've seen so far, that the Russian government did not expect this level of uh, economic isolation. And so, you know, it, it's all in context. It's both in context with this war, but also with in context over time of how, um, you know, the U.S. and European governments are, are signaling to the world its level of commitment to certain basic principles in the international system, which is that you cannot just um, invade a sovereign country. Well, what kind of point that I would uh, add there about oligarch uh, sanctions is that, you know, one thing that's very clear is that the presence of Putin-connected uh, oligarchs and kleptocrats and their sort of wealth networks uh, across Western democracies was, was also uh, in part an effort by the Kremlin to buy influence, to uh, disrupt um, democratic processes in some uh, cases, 
and that disentangling ourselves from this is good as an end in itself. Right. I think the I think one of the natural follow-ons this right is we've seen this coming up from a few different people in the Q and A is we've seen pretty clear blowback uh, uh, like spillover effects from these sanctions that were arguably predictable in terms of the commodity prices, in terms of the oil prices. And so from your vantage point, was, what was the risk calculus from the, US's, uh, from the US's perspective or the European Union's perspective adequately thought through? Was there something that we missed when we were thinking about when the initial implementation of the sanctions was put in place? I just, I just want to start and say that the largest, I think, implication is in the commodities market, and it's due to the paralyzation of the farming land in Ukraine and in Russia. And that's not because of the sanctions regime, that's because of the war that has been conducted by Russia. And so I think we just have to be very clear about where are the shocks happening and what is causing those shocks. I do think that the reason why both the European and U.S. government have been reluctant to focus on energy is because they do not want to cause, you know, a paralysis in the global economy. And so it's been, you know, the, the slowest thing to be targeted um, in the regime. Uh, but I do, I mean, I just think like you, you, you can't turn this back on the sanctions regime when it's the war that is causing all of these uh, primary ripple effects through the global economy. That all being said, I think Nick Mulder, he has a great book on the economic we weapon and sanctions where, you know, he, he basically talks about like, don't you also need a global Keynesianism to go with, uh, you know, a sanctions regime? And I think that we will be seeing that. Uh, but I also think, at least in my mind, um, it was very hard to predict how this war was going to, the, the level um, of the war and also the, the corresponding sanctions that would be rolled out because of that level. Um, you know, if I think there's been plenty of reports in the Chinese media of their lack of, uh, you know, forewarning to the extent of the conflict. And so I think, you know, it's hard to then in hindsight um, say we weren't prepared to uh, buffer the secondary consequences of our secondary sanctions uh, when the war itself was all very, um, uh, you know, unpredictable. Yeah, and, and, if, and if I just add in that context, I think we had the very odd sort of circumstance quite early on in that period where sanctions were coming fast and furious, sort of self-sanctioning was coming or announcements were coming fast and furious, where even the kind of very extensive exemptions, uh, especially on energy from the get-go, um, and, and by energy, I mean current energy transactions, not investment in energy and all sorts of things that face restrictions, uh, but also on food and, and humanitarian supplies and fertilizer. Now, while it's definitely true that um, things, sanctions on Belarus and other logistics elements made it much more, more difficult, I do think there is a, as a treasury and its counterparts were in the difficult situation of saying, hey guys, these, these exemptions are still here. Um, this is allowed. And that sort of is over, you know, sort of that, that, that over compliance also leads to some sort of policy questions. I think this comes does come back to the fact that we're dealing with um, a country that is producing a lot of, of items that, that we can't um, immediately uh, live, live without. And so that's where I think this issue uh, sort of come, you know, sort of come, comes to play. Um, and that the, some of it is also around what messages are sent about adjustment and what those, what those costs are and um, you know, and the like. But this, normally when we talk about sanctions and humanitarian issues, we think about getting the goods into the target country. This was a case where it was as much about getting those items out. And that's something that uh, is, is, is more difficult for what, what Ben, I think, rightly highlighted are still not as many policymakers as you think around the world, especially when you're looking at sanctions programs outside the U.S. Thank you, Rachel. So I think we're quickly running out of time. And so I just want to wrap up with one big picture question. So obviously we're talking about weaponization, different nodes, the global economy here. Uh, according to you, which node are we is, is being underappreciated right now, or unrecognized that is likely to be weaponized going forward? 
Uh, I mean, in, in my opinion, most of the focus has been on the dollar and the dollar system, um, which is really, I think, the one that has been around the longest. People have used that. I mean, that's not a, a, a it's not specific to the Russia uh, sanctions regime. I think the thing that we're seeing increasingly um, used are um, intellectual property, uh, particularly a, a, around the export controls and foreign product rules. And those, I think, are 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 very interesting and it's very hard to track um which products have which intellectual property and um i think that's where businesses and governments are likely to get kind of ensnared in the trap of weaponized interdependence that they maybe didn't realize everybody has their war chest of you know reserves to guard shield against the us dollar but how do they get a, a, around you know um qualcomm uh, chip uh, designs, and you know that's really it's it's much harder. Right, Rachel, Ben, either of you want to add in? Or... I'll just say one thing that I'm kind of concerned about uh, going forward is the longer that this war of attrition lasts, the more escalated uh, it gets. Um, you know, something I'm very concerned about being deeply disrupted and weaponized is the um, border regime between uh, Russia and the West. One of the big fears in uh, for the Russian middle class right now is the border will close uh, permanently or there will be uh, exit visas that will be uh, brought on or there will be a kind of escalatory tit for tat where some countries have already stopped issuing visas to all Russian citizens in the European Union that could be uh, expanded uh, potentially. The Biden administration is currently drawing up plans to uh, see if it can harvest uh, Russian scientists and uh, specialists uh, for a new kind of visa category uh, to the United States and could there be in response, um, you know, movement restrictions placed on uh, people of those professions? They've already, there's already been uh, some news about um, uh, Russian scientists uh, being discouraged from attending international conferences at the current time because of emigration or uh, asylum uh, fears. So I think that that very basic uh, freedom that Russians felt that they'd won with the end of the Soviet uh, Union is uh, something that uh, we should be concerned about going forward. Rachel, do you want to have the last word? No, I, I think uh, I just uh, echo, echo what uh, Ben and, and Abe said. Um, the, I guess the next... The next nodes I think I'm I'm really watching for is around these issues of of secondary you know secondary sanctions and next levels forward. So far, we've seen Chinese entities, for example, really uh, not wanting to sort of be the go-betweens, um, uh, in part because of not wanting to lose access to transaction markets, credit card processing, and the like. It's been very difficult to think about how Russian Russians can engage in transactions at scale. Um, whether it's in, in digital assets or kind of across the board. Um, but I, am, I sort of think going forward, this question mark, as there's more and more sort of loophole closures and the like, um, what that's going to mean. And also, what are the entities in other countries, sort of some of the Central, Europe, uh, Central, well, Central, uh, Central, Central Asian countries, for example, that were reliant on some of these uh, transfer systems and, and the like. So these next levels, particularly as we're getting more and more towards um, European efforts to sort of reduce reliance on uh, Russian fuel, I think you get to a whole set of different issues about what this reluctance to engage in, in, in backfilling. So it's that question mark of are there, you know, sort of uh, barter systems or sort of you know, whack-a-mole kind of efforts. So it's not maybe not a whole nother node, um, but it is this um, uh, element uh, here of uh, what are the sort of are, are can there be sub nodes develop and then can those in turn be weaponized?